Today's episode examines a case involving domestic violence and may be disturbing. Listener discretion is advised. A young mother kisses her daughter goodbye and waves as she boards a plane with her babysitter bound for Texas. In secret, she's constructed a plan which will enable her to gather up her belongings and take flight days later, reuniting with her parents and children in her home state, but she never makes it. Days pass and no one sees or hears a word from Regina Brown. A devoted mother, her children get no calls. A loving daughter, her parents receive no word. A hard and dedicated worker, she misses two shifts at work after five years of never missing a single one. The investigation is hampered by a severe lack of evidence. Her home is searched, but nothing there suggests a crime was committed. Her car is found, but there's no forensic evidence connecting the vehicle to her disappearance. A history of domestic violence, threats, and intimidation is uncovered, but Regina's estranged husband remains outspoken of his innocence and police lack any evidence to tie him to his soon-to-be ex-wife's mysterious disappearance. Over the course of the next 30 years, the investigation starts and stops. New evidence is uncovered, new witnesses are interviewed, and a massive search is launched on the very street where Regina lived in her last days. The case becomes one of controversy, with police accused of a failure to investigate properly and the media blamed for their lack of coverage due to differences in race and the absence of details to sensationalize. Still, the questions remain. What happened to Regina Brown after leaving the airport and just who might hold those answers? This is Trace Evidence, Episode 166, The Vanishing of Regina Brown, Part 2. Welcome to Trace Evidence. I'm your host, Stephen Pacheco. Today, we will continue to examine Regina Brown's mysterious 1987 disappearance from Connecticut, covering the divorce, the evolution of the investigation, new searches, and the status of the case today. Before getting back into the case, just a few notes about the show. Trace Evidence is a weekly true crime podcast focused on unsolved murders and disappearances. You can follow the show on social media on Twitter at TraceEvPod, Instagram at TraceEvidencePod, or by searching Facebook for Trace Evidence. If you're interested in supporting the show and getting some Trace Evidence merch, there's a Patreon at patreon.com slash traceevidence, or you can donate directly via PayPal. Visit trace-evidence.com for all social media links, donation options, and contact information. You can submit case suggestions through the website or email me directly at traceevidencepod at gmail.com. When Regina Brown vanished on March 26, 1987, a week would pass before a missing persons report was called in. A difficult, intense divorce trial would reveal disturbing information. A legal battle would ensue over custody of the children. A missing plane would eventually be found and two phone calls would lead to a massive search. This is episode 166, The Vanishing of Regina Brown, Part 2. Previously on Trace Evidence, Regina Fontenot married Willis Brown in the summer of 1982. Over the course of the next five years, they would live in Newtown, Connecticut, going on to have three children. Almost from the outset of the marriage, Brown was looking for a divorce. His reasons included accusations that Regina abused drugs and alcohol, that she had mental health issues, and that she had been unfaithful, with Willis going on to claim on multiple occasions that none of their three children belonged to him, despite paternity tests proving they were definitely his biological children. Regina argued over those five years that she had been subjected to multiple instances of psychological and physical abuse. Police had been called to the home on more than one occasion and even arrested Willis once, charging him with assault before dropping those charges under the agreement that he would seek counseling. Brown admitted to at least one assault, though he later claimed that he believed Regina had planned out the whole situation to get him arrested. 
Friends noted that Regina lived in fear of Brown, and on more than one occasion, she made it clear that she believed he was willing to kill her. Regina would go on to acquire a restraining order against Brown, though she would also break the terms of that restraining order. Brown served Regina with divorce papers once prior to 1987, but she had strived to make the marriage work. In the end, though, there was little she could do, and the abuse escalated to a point where she believed divorce was the best option. In December of 1986, the divorce officially began, and Regina accepted that this was what had to be done. Unfortunately, the 35-year-old mother of three would mysteriously vanish in March of 87, six months before the divorce trial even began. Regina Brown was last seen alive on the evening of Thursday, March 26, 1987, when she sent her youngest child and live-in babysitter, Sharon Ryan, down to Texas to stay with her parents where her two oldest children already were. At 7.08 p.m., she placed a call to her mother from a payphone at the airport to confirm that the flight had boarded and they were on their way. At the time, Regina didn't mention to her mother that she, too, would be coming to Texas. But Regina never made it, and instead, mysteriously disappeared sometime over the course of the next 24 hours. Approximately seven hours after placing that call, Newtown police received calls regarding a barking dog at Regina's home on Whippoorwill Hill Road. Despite multiple calls coming through over the next several days, no police officers were sent to investigate the barking or check in on the residents. It wouldn't be until Thursday, April 2nd, a full week after Regina was last seen, that anyone would go to the house to check in on her. This, as it turns out, was all kicked off by Regina herself. A few days before she vanished, the young mother contacted her best friend, Hope Lambert, and revealed that she had put a plan into motion through which she hoped to escape from her estranged husband, Willis Brown. As part of that plan, Regina would send her daughter to Texas before returning home to finalize plans for her own trip. Regina specifically requested that Lambert place a call to her parents should Regina herself not contact her within 24 hours. If Regina's parents hadn't heard from her, then she was to wait another two days before calling back. If, by the second call, no one had heard from Regina, then Hope Lambert would need to explain the situation and begin the search for her friend. According to Lambert, Regina made it clear how grave the situation was, saying in the second phone call, quote, If they still haven't heard from me, Willis will have done what he said he would. End quote. Lambert later told the Hartford Courant that when she heard on the news that a flight attendant was missing from Newtown, she immediately knew it was Regina. When police spoke to Brown, he claimed to have no knowledge of his soon-to-be ex-wife's disappearance, and he denied having been inside the Newtown home between late March and after she disappeared. Neighbors, however, placed Brown at the home around the time Regina was last seen, and a large bag of dog food found in the house was in his possession at that time. Brown would later admit to buying the dog food, though he alleged he didn't put it in the home before Regina vanished, nor did he feed the dog. When asked where he believed Regina could possibly be, Brown directed investigators to search in, quote, drug-infested areas of New York City, end quote. Eleven days after disappearing, Regina's car was found abandoned in just such a place. Located at 242 West 104th Street on Manhattan's Upper West Side. According to investigators, the car had been parked in that spot since around the time of the disappearance as multiple parking tickets had accumulated. The vehicle didn't show any evidence of a crime, though there were many questions about its condition. The doors were left unlocked, a single key sticking out of the ignition. Regina's keychain, according to Sharon Ryan, had six to seven keys on it, but this key was by itself. On the passenger seat, there was a grocery bag inside of which police found several of Regina's belongings. The car was eventually towed to Connecticut to the crime lab, where the vehicle was closely examined, though no helpful evidence was found. Police theorized the car could have been left there by someone who had dumped Regina elsewhere, and perhaps it had been abandoned in a bad area with the key in the ignition and the doors unlocked, with the hopes that it might be stolen, which would have further confused the investigation. Within two weeks of Regina's disappearance, the investigation would shift. 
Initially looked at as a situation in which Regina may have left of her own volition and would likely return, the discovery of her car and interactions with Willis Brown had led police to believe foul play was more than likely involved. Aside from recovering and processing Regina's car, Newtown police did visit the home following a call from her neighbor and friend, Linda Van Horn, who entered the home in search of Regina. At the time, no evidence of a crime was found, with police finding only Regina's ID badge and scarf, her purse with an uncashed paycheck worth $1,000, and the dog she had bought for protection, who had been locked out of the main house with only a dish of water and the aforementioned bag of dog food. The state police's mobile crime lab wouldn't arrive at the new town home until Monday, May 11th, six weeks after the mother of three vanished. In the interim, live-in babysitter Sharon Ryan returned from Texas and, after being interviewed by police, was allowed to move back into the house. This upset Linda Van Horn, not just because she felt no one should have been in the home prior to the arrival of the crime lab, but because Sharon cleaned the house and finished repair work started by Regina, including painting a wall. Police, however, argued that there was little Ryan could do to conceal any evidence of a crime in the house. Even repainting a wall wouldn't matter because, as police chief DeJoseph later said, if there was blood evidence on that wall, the lab would find it, new paint or not. At the time, the Newtown police were under a lot of scrutiny. As the Hella Crafts investigation developed through late 1986, they were officially removed from that case, which was turned over to the state police. Many locals, including Linda Van Horn, believed that the Newtown PD had screwed up the investigation as arrest did not occur until after they lost the case. This would have resounding effects on the investigation into Regina's disappearance. While there were many who felt the Newtown PD moved too slowly, Chief DeJoseph later explained that due to the scrutiny after losing the Crafts case, they wanted to ensure absolutely everything was done by the book. This meant coordinating with Regina's lawyer, Hugh Lavery, on getting access to search the home and filing the appropriate paperwork. According to DeJoseph, this is why the crime lab did not arrive for six weeks. This leads us to where we left off at the end of part one, in early May of 1987, six weeks after Regina Brown vanished. On the morning of Monday, May 11th, the state police mobile crime lab arrived and a thorough search of the Brown home was conducted. Technicians searched for evidence and gathered items they thought could be connected to the case. One item recovered included a white jacket owned by Regina, which she was known to have been wearing when she was last seen alive at LaGuardia Airport in New York on March 26th. No solid evidence of a crime was discovered in the home and as such, the Newtown police were left trying to determine what might have happened to Regina, essentially from square one. They had her car, but it did not offer any answers either. While the search of the home provided no answers in relation to a crime, one discovery did leave investigators concerned. In a kitchen drawer, they found dozens of newspaper articles which had been cut out and saved. Every article is related to the Hella Crafts case. Hella was a flight attendant with three children, and her husband Richard was a pilot. Many believe Regina filed this case closely not just because the Crafts had lived less than three miles away, but because she feared her own fate might lie in the hands of her soon-to-be ex-husband, also an airline pilot. Police suspicion turned towards Willis Brown in light of the newspaper clippings, statements given by Regina's friends, family, and co-workers, and due to Brown's own statements, in which he talked negatively about Regina after her disappearance and seemed disinterested in what might have happened to her. Unfortunately, without evidence, there was little they could do to corner Brown. Investigators later noted that he did not attempt to stop speaking with them, though he would only talk to them on his own terms and by his own schedule. Finally, when asked, Willis agreed to take a polygraph in regard to Regina's disappearance, but only if it was done after the divorce trial, which was set to begin in September. Over the course of the next month, Linda Van Horn grew frustrated and suspicious. According to statements she made to the Hartford Courant, she was highly suspicious of Brown and believed he was likely responsible for Regina's disappearance. According to Linda, Brown was aware of her opinions and would oftentimes make inappropriate jokes when he saw her, including referring to Linda as Jessica Fletcher, 
a reference to Angela Lansbury's character on the famous television show Murder, She Wrote. On at least one occasion, Van Horn claimed that she saw Brown exiting his vehicle at the new town home carrying a shovel. Van Horn told the Courant that Brown gestured with the shovel and said to her, quote, Do you suppose they'll think this is the shovel I buried her with? End quote. At the time, Brown was the only person of interest in the case, and he reportedly enjoyed the attention, often joking about the entire situation. One month later in June, Brown would turn his attention away from Connecticut when he reached out to Regina's parents in Texas. Willis believed the three children in their mother's absence should immediately be returned to his custody. According to Regina's mother, Ernestine, he made several calls asking for the children until she finally told him she would not be returning the kids until Regina showed back up. According to her testimony, Brown's response was, quote, Well, I suppose that's a long time. End quote. Brown later testified that, after this call, he began formulating a plan to go and get the kids himself, or, as he would put it, a plan to spirit the kids away and liberate them. According to more than 10 pages of testimony during the divorce trial, Brown explained his trip to get the kids back, which he referred to as a mission. Prior to leaving the Northeast, Brown purchased a 1979 Cadillac because, as he explained, He needed a big car for this task, and he also needed one where if the kids spilled milkshakes or hamburgers on the seats, he, quote, wouldn't go crazy. Driving for the better part of two days, Brown arrived in Texas where he parked the Cadillac before renting a different car. He then proceeded to the Fontenot residence where he was able to visit with the kids, supervised by Regina's younger brother, Sonny. During the visit, Brown purchased several items, some being gifts for the children, others for family members. Together, the group of Brown, Sonny, and the three kids went over to a motel where he was staying. At some point, once inside, Sonny had to use the bathroom. When he closed the door behind him, Brown leapt into action and managed to tie the door in such a way where it couldn't be opened from the inside. Sonny began fighting to escape the bathroom while Brown told the two older children to go out and get in the car as he picked up the youngest. As he was preparing to leave, Sonny escaped the bathroom and a struggle began between father and uncle. Brown later testified that a so-called tug of war began with Sonny grabbing for the child, getting a hand of her arms, while Brown himself hung on to her legs. Angry and frustrated, Brown and Sonny put the child down and engaged in a physical altercation which left Sonny temporarily incapacitated. At that point, Brown picked up the child under one arm and his luggage under the other, and the two began making their way towards the car. Sonny managed to get back to his feet and ran out into the parking lot where he and Brown began fighting again. Again, as in the first time, Brown being the larger and stronger of the two, he subdued Sonny before placing the child in the car and speeding off. Gloating about the fight during the trial, Brown claimed he had been holding back against Sonny, saying, quote, I just wanted to show him that not all 52-year-old men are weak, end quote. Once they'd driven off, Brown went straight to the car rental business where he turned in his vehicle and switched to the Cadillac he'd bought for the trip. Somehow, during the rush to swap cars, Brown forgot about the trunk and left behind all of the children's clothing as well as the items he had purchased. During the trial three months later, Brown complained of how he'd bought his father a pair of cowboy boots and he was still annoyed about having lost the money he spent. At the time, there was little legal recourse which could be taken as while the children had been in the care of their maternal grandparents, Brown was their father and had legal rights to their custody. Two months after this, in August, Brown's lawyer filed with the courts for him to be granted full custody of the three kids with Willis no longer denying their paternity. At the same time, the Fontenot's also filed for custody. The proceedings would ultimately involve lawyers for Brown, the Fontenot's, and Regina's lawyer. In hopes of sorting his way through the confusion, the judge ordered that all parties involved must undergo psychiatric evaluations as there were accusations flying on each side. According to the Hartford Courant, Dr. Harvey L. Glass administered tests which were comprised of 1,526 questions designed to determine if any litigant was a danger to the children. 
Dr. Glass testified that Brown possessed the ability to appear outwardly calm while experiencing a rage. Brown apparently scored high on the paranoia scale and exhibited, quote, overcontrolled hostility. Despite this, Dr. Glass stated he was biased towards wanting the children to be returned to their natural father on general principle. When asked about Brown's earlier denials of paternity, Dr. Glass testified that Brown knew he was the father all along. Glass stated that Brown was, quote, stating a denial of paternity. He was making a considerable issue out of it, but I don't know what his purposes were, end quote. Norman Voog, who was the attorney hired by the Fontenot's and Regina's lawyer Hugh Lavery, argued before the court that Brown invented stories about Regina being unfaithful in order to win a better divorce settlement and keep his property and money from being awarded to Regina in any way. The Fontenot's argued that Brown had called them and offered up a deal. He would rescind his claim for custody if they agreed to relinquish all claims to his assets. In the end, the judge ruled that the decision of who had custody of the children would be determined by the judge in the divorce trial, and until that judgment was rendered, the three kids would be returned to the Fontenot's, who would possess temporary custody. One month later in September, the divorce trial started in Superior Court in Danbury and was presided over by Judge Howard J. Morgan. Months earlier, Morgan had been the judge who had ultimately granted a change of venue in the murder trial against Richard Crafts. Throughout the divorce, the legal teams for the Fontenot's, Regina, and the children painted a dark and disturbing picture of Brown. He was presented as an absentee father and physically abusive husband. The lawyers made sure that the judge heard evidence which suggested that Brown may have been responsible for Regina's disappearance. And while they attacked Brown's character, they also tore apart his financial claims, alleging that the affidavits he'd been required to file did not accurately represent his money and assets. One item brought up was the moped man business that Brown owned on Block Island. Brown argued that he was not the sole owner of the business, but that his daughters from his first marriage owned 50% of it and that it had been established to pay for their college. Brown stated that he paid his daughters a salary and would mail them checks in the off-season, which he referred to as management bonuses. Beyond that, he argued that the business had had some rough years and he'd been forced to dump a lot of his own money into it to help it stay afloat. He testified that in 1985, he'd given up his stake in the home he'd shared with his former wife in exchange for a $70,000 loan to help the business. He also acknowledged that prior to Regina's disappearance, he had approached her about taking out a loan on their new town home, but she ultimately refused to do so. A month later in April, his first wife granted him a loan of $103,000, though Brown complained to the judge that she was charging him exorbitant interest rates, which he compared to those of a loan shark. Another asset that Brown had failed to include in his affidavit were his retirement benefits, set to kick in when he reached the age of 60. These benefits would include a payment of more than $500,000. Brown, however, explained to the judge that his retirement benefits had not been included in his affidavit because, in his own words, quote, I don't pay attention to those benefits, end quote. Judge Morgan seemed unmoved by Brown's financial testimony. In the midst of the trial, the investigation into Regina's disappearance was still ongoing. On Wednesday, November 18, 1987, the state police brought in cadaver dogs to work with searchers as they combed through more than 30 acres of land in and surrounding the Whippoorwill Hill Road neighborhood. Ultimately, nothing was found during the search, and just a month later, the 23-day divorce trial came to a close in December. Four months after that, in April of 1988, 13 months after Regina vanished, Judge Morgan issued his ruling for the divorce. He rejected Brown's testimony in regard to his financial situation, saying, at least in terms of the moped business, he had presented an unbelievable scenario about how ownership was arranged. When it came to his marriage to Regina, Judge Morgan issued a scathing statement about Brown, saying, quote, he has physically and mentally abused her and reduced her existence to a living nightmare. Her life since her marriage to the plaintiff might be said to be one of figurative bondage. End quote. Ultimately, custody of the children was awarded to the Fontenot's, and Brown was ordered to make monthly child support payments totaling $2,250. In addition to this, 
Judge Morgan awarded Regina's estate a 25% interest in the new townhouse, as well as a $25,000 cash payment from Brown. Brown was also ordered to pay the vast majority of Regina's legal fees, which at the time totaled approximately $106,000. To say Brown was angered by the ruling is an understatement. Through his lawyer, Brown filed an ethics complaint against Judge Morgan, accusing him of trying him for murder rather than overseeing a divorce, and he later referred to the judge as a scumbag and the trial as a turkey shoot. This was likely due in part to another statement Morgan made during his divorce ruling in which he said, quote, It is also equally unanimous among all the witnesses that Regina Brown would never voluntarily leave her children and certainly would never fail to communicate with them were she able to do so, end quote. Judge Morgan, when asked about this years later, told Connecticut Magazine, quote, I was accused by him of conducting a murder trial. Whatever happened to her, I hope she didn't suffer because she had suffered so much already, end quote. Following the conclusion of the divorce trial, Brown was again approached by police in regard to the polygraph test he'd agreed to take. By this point, though, he had changed his mind, telling investigators he wouldn't take the test, making reference to the fact that Richard Crafts had passed a polygraph and yet he was still charged with his wife's murder. It was also around this time that Brown decided he no longer wished to speak to investigators about the case, and from that day forward, he told them to direct all questions and inquiries to his lawyer directly. Once the police could no longer question him, Brown turned his attention back to the divorce trial, and specifically the judge. Brown went on to file an appeal in hopes of obtaining a better divorce settlement, but this didn't go in his favor. He'd already received several citations for failure to pay child support, and in hopes of wrangling his way out of the ruling, in July of 1989, more than two years after Regina was last seen, he went into court and filed for bankruptcy under Chapter 11. He would later state that filing for bankruptcy was a move suggested by his lawyer to insulate himself. At the time, he was completely unaware that police were putting pieces into place to pursue a warrant to search lands he had owned and lived on on Block Island. This would all be based upon two phone calls they'd received, one from a landlord and the other from a member of Brown's own extended family. The first call came in to the Newtown police from a woman named Marianne Matthews. Matthews lived on Block Island where her father, David Goburn, owned property and a trailer which was often rented out during the summer. According to Matthews, on April 2, 1987, six days after Regina vanished, Willis Brown arrived at her door and inquired about renting the trailer. Matthews says she tried to explain to Brown that the trailer didn't go up for rent until Memorial Day, but he was insistent that he wanted to rent it immediately. Matthews ended up allowing Brown to rent the trailer for the summer of 87, and during that time, Brown his father, Willis Brown Sr., and his stepmother, Margaret Brown, all stayed there on the island. Brown would rent the trailer again the following summer. At the time, Matthews didn't think much of it, though she did claim to have felt intimidated by Brown, which was one of the reasons she allowed him to rent it early. After an article about the case appeared in newspapers, Matthews was contacted by her father, who explained the situation to her, and she was compelled to call police. This was an important piece of information for investigators because at the time of the trailer rental in 1987, Brown had told police he only stayed in one of two places, his apartment in Queens, New York, or at his moped rental business on Block Island. He never mentioned staying in this trailer, and when the Newtown police heard about it, they immediately became suspicious as to why Brown had failed to mention it, and if he could have stayed at his business, why did he rent the trailer in the first place? Their suspicions only became heightened when on Monday, March 6th, Detective Norian received a call from a man named Randy Locke. As it turned out, Locke was the son of Margaret Brown, Willis Brown's stepmother. A year earlier on Tuesday, March 22nd, just a few days shy of the one-year anniversary of Regina's disappearance, New York police responded to a call of shots fired. At approximately 7 p.m., Albany police arrived in an apartment building and entered the couple's third-floor apartment, where they discovered Margaret's body on the bedroom floor. She had died as the result of a single gunshot wound to the chest, determined to have been fired from close range. 
At the time, Willis Brown Sr., who was 77, was arrested and charged with fourth-degree criminal possession of illegal weapons when police found two loaded three fifty seven Magnum handguns. Ultimately, through their investigation, police would rule that Margaret's death was a suicide, though there were details which confused many, including the fact that two gunshots were heard by witnesses and police determined two shots had been fired. The first shot passed through a window. The second struck Margaret in the chest, ending her life. It's hard to disagree with the Hartford Courant, who made the tongue-in-cheek mention that the only logical explanation was that Margaret must have somehow missed her first shot. A year later, in March of 1989, her son Randy was going through her belongings when he discovered a crudely hand-drawn map. According to the legend written on the map, it represented Block Island. What caught his attention, and that of police, was a spot marked on the map and labeled as, quote, Regina, oh God. In response to both calls and the map, police began questioning friends and family of Margaret Brown in hopes of determining if she'd ever made mention of the map, her stepson, or her missing stepdaughter-in-law. When speaking with Margaret's sister, she alleged that Margaret had made accusations about Brown's involvement in Regina's disappearance. The sister told investigators that Margaret, when talking about Block Island, had said, quote, Strange things have happened there. Willis Brown Jr. murdered his wife. End quote. This statement, along with the map and statements from both Marianne Matthews and David Goburn, were included in affidavits presented to a judge in an effort to obtain search warrants. On Wednesday, September 27th, District Court Judge John J. Capelli granted warrants for police to begin a search for Regina's body. The warrants allowed investigators to search land owned by Brown and Goburn near the highest point of the island. New Shoreham police were joined by both the Newtown Police and the Massachusetts State Police for a large-scale search. The search was conducted over three days and included the use of cadaver dogs, according to State Trooper Kathy Barrett. Unfortunately, Much as previous searches had ended, no evidence was discovered, nor were the remains of Regina Brown located. Police Chief DeJoseph later told Connecticut Magazine, quote, We were so sure that we would find her, but then again, the dogs could have missed her. She still may be out there somewhere, end quote. While police were unable to advance the investigation into Regina's disappearance, Brown's attempt to file for bankruptcy was not going the way he'd planned. While he failed to make eight months' worth of child support payments and was claiming he didn't have the money to do so, he was not only bringing in more money than he'd previously brought in, but he was spending quite a bit as well. Court records showed that in February of 88, he'd been promoted from co-pilot to pilot at American Airlines, increasing his annual salary by $25,000. He'd also managed to work out a deal with a longtime employee of the Moped Man business who would now lease it from him paying Brown an additional $100,000 a year. A restaurant was built on property owned by Brown, and this provided him with approximately $20,000 a year in rent. That same summer, Brown began renting out the Whippoorwill Hill Road house to the tune of $1,400 a month or an additional $16,800 a year in income. This payment was not included on Brown's bankruptcy petition. While Brown alleged that he did not have the money necessary to make the payments he had to make, he'd managed to send his father to Aruba for vacation. Brown himself took vacation in France, and he also funded a trip for two of his daughters to go to Cancun. Later, he spent $12,000 on a wedding for another daughter. Bringing up all of these items in court made it difficult for Brown to cling to the claim that he was financially insolvent and therefore had fallen behind on his payments, but he was going to try anyway. On Wednesday, November 22nd, Brown took the stand to testify in federal bankruptcy court in Providence, Rhode Island. 54 at the time, Brown testified that he was not making very much money and was essentially a low-income bookkeeper. At the same time, he also agreed with court estimates showing that his net worth was approximately $1 million. One month later, on December 22nd, The bankruptcy judge ordered Brown's Chapter 11 filing to be converted into a Chapter 7 liquidation. Essentially, in Chapter 11, the debtor, Brown in this case, 
would be able to negotiate with those he owed money to without having to sell off assets. But in Chapter 7, the debtor's assets can be sold off in order to satisfy the debts owed. The judge questioned Brown's statements regarding his finances and found them to be lacking credibility, stating that Brown's, quote, misstatements and omissions under oath may constitute bankruptcy crime, end quote. At that time, Brown refused to turn over his assets to a court-appointed trustee, thus earning himself another contempt citation. The previous month of November 1989 saw a conviction in the Hella Crafts case. Richard Crafts would be tried twice. In the first case, a mistrial was declared when 11 jurors voted to convict, but the 12th walked out of deliberations refusing to vote. A second trial was held, and much like the first, this trial was subject to a change of venue, sending the case to Norwalk. On November 21, 1989, Richard Crafts was found guilty of murdering his wife, Hella. Two months later, in January of 1990, Crafts was sentenced to serve 50 years in state prison. Three years had passed between Kraft's arrest and sentencing, and throughout that time, media coverage slowly faded. What had been a story extensively covered in New England and receiving national attention appeared to have lost interest for the media and its audience by 1990. During the Kraft's investigation, allegations had been made against the Newtown Police Department that they had failed to properly investigate the case, this being a prime reason it was taken from them and given to state police. The then head of the detective bureau was Michael DeJoseph. In October of 1987, the Newtown Police Commission voted 3-2 to to replace the then-retiring chief, Louis Marchese, with DeJoseph. A local private investigator called for an investigation into the way Newtown had handled the Crafts case and specifically called out DeJoseph. In the press, DeJoseph said he welcomed the investigation and even signed a contract taking over as police chief which stipulated that he would be dismissed should a review find the Crafts case was improperly handled. At the time, the review was set to begin following the Crafts trial, but was later delayed pending the outcome of Richard Crafts' appeals. Linda Van Horn, when speaking to the Hartford Courant, later expressed her frustration with this choice, saying, quote, which means it'll never happen. We're a small town. End quote. For the record, Richard Crafts was released from prison in January of 2020 after having served a little over 30 years of his 50 year sentence, much to the outrage of the media as well as Hella Crafts' friends and family. His early release has been chalked up to a record of good behavior, and today he is 84 years old. At the same time, Regina's case essentially fell off the map. There was little coverage between her disappearance and 1990 with the Crafts case taking center stage. Throughout many articles, Regina began being referred to as the other pilot's wife or the other missing flight attendant. When asked about the lack of coverage, R. Scooter Smith, the editor and publisher of the Newtown Bee, told the Hartford Courant, quote, People lost interest. Crafts got boring, too, after a while. End quote. When a reporter from the Courant went to Newtown, they were surprised to find that many locals couldn't recall hearing about Regina's case, and those who had couldn't remember most of the details. As one neighbor explained, quote, It's not that I don't care. There just hasn't been that much press about it. End quote. At least in the eyes of the media and much of the public, Regina's case was disappearing. When asked about it, investigators would only say it remained an active case. When asked about Willis Brown, officials were hesitant to name him as either a suspect or even a person of interest. On Tuesday, November 13, 1990, WCVB-TV in Boston aired a documentary about Regina's case entitled Regina Brown, The Other Pilot's Wife. During this broadcast, there were interviews with Regina's mother as well as friends and family. They dug deep into the case and, for the most part, presented what most people familiar with the case believed to be the most likely scenario, that Regina had been the victim of foul play and the only person who had ever come under suspicion was her ex-husband, Willis Brown. In response to this show, Brown filed a lawsuit for defamation, invasion of privacy, and intentional infliction of emotional distress because there was a heavy implication that he was the person responsible for his wife's disappearance. Ultimately. The case was dismissed. 
when Brown appealed that decision on the basis that the first trial had gone to summary judgment rather than being heard from a jury, this too was dismissed by the appeals court. Though Brown has rarely spoken with the media regarding the case, the Courant reports that he acknowledged many people believe he's guilty, but he says he is innocent. Reportedly, Brown noted that he would prove his innocence as soon as he has the ability to prove two things, though what those two things are he's never explained. Brown also noted that he planned to continue his pursuit of custody of the children, though those legal attempts would be held off pending completion of his bankruptcy case. At the time, he made trips to Texas where he would visit the children. When asked about the visits, Regina's mother told the Courant, quote, He buys them all kinds of things. I think he's trying to bribe their love, and they're young. They don't understand. End quote. Ernestine added that the children have since stopped asking about their mother and when she might return. Regina's oldest daughter, Raina, later spoke to the Connecticut Post saying, quote, I remember standing by the window and asking my grandmother when my mom was coming to get me. She just cried. End quote. Over the course of the next decade, from 1990 to 2000, Regina's case seemed to ebb and flow, with investigators pouring energy and attention into it at different times while trying to keep up with new and developing cases. Detective Tavardzik, the lead on Regina's case for the Newtown PD, enlisted the assistance of the FBI at one point, though this did not appear to advance their efforts beyond gathering additional interviews with witnesses and potentially a profile, though that has never been released. When asked about this, Tavardzik explained, quote, we even had the FBI profile the case in 1989, but the bottom line was there was no physical evidence. End quote. As for media coverage, following the Boston News program, few other programs took a look. According to the Newtown B, producers for Unsolved Mysteries came to Newtown and a script was written for an episode based on Regina's case, though this story was never filmed nor aired. In 1995, eight years after she was last seen, Regina Brown was officially declared dead, with the probate court listing her date of death as Thursday, March 26, 1987. In August of 1999, 12 years after her disappearance, the Newtown Bee released an article discussing the status of the case more than a decade later. Detective Tavardzik sat down for an interview and when asked about the investigation, replied, quote, Basically, there's been no new information in the past few years to follow up on. We've researched various rumors that she's been seen in the Danbury area, but these have always been false. End quote. According to Tavardzik, over the previous 12 years, the investigation had followed tips and leads to seven different states, though all appear to have stopped at dead ends. In addition to following leads, investigators kept up on unidentified bodies found across the country. According to her listing on NamUs, 24 comparisons have been attempted, but there have been no matches to Regina Brown. According to the article, Willis Brown maintained a residence on Block Island after moving to Texas in 98 to be closer to the children. When asked about Brown's involvement in the case, Detective Tavarzik explained, quote, We've never had an inquiry from him about the investigation, nor has there ever been a show of concern from him. End quote. Regina's father, Emil, passed away in 1988, just over a year after Regina was last seen. Ernestine moved forward, raising their three grandchildren, though as years progressed, she struggled financially and no longer had the ability to continue combating custody claims in the courtroom. She would pass away in 2006. 2007 marked 20 years since Regina's disappearance, and it appeared the case was still frozen in time. The evidence remained the same, the theories the same, and as had been with the situation early on, the inability to find anything to move forward hampered advancements. Without stronger evidence, physical evidence, something to warrant a charge, Regina's case was considered cold. A slew of articles came out that year, most of them discussing the failure of investigators to build a solid case. A lot of parallels were drawn between Regina's unsolved case and that of Hella Crafts, and one argument made at the time was that, while the Crafts case had physical evidence, there was not an established history of abuse on file with police, 
Yet, in Regina's case, they knew of abuse. They knew of a dangerous environment for the mother of three, and yet they weren't able to connect anyone to the crime. Detective Tavardzik, who has since retired after 33 years on the job, took the case very personally and desperately wanted to break it. He followed up on every lead he received over the years and even returned to Block Island in 2003, handing out flyers and interviewing locals, though he reported that many were unaware of the case, and for those who were, they had little interest in discussing it. He later stated that, in 1987, they lacked both the resources and personnel to conduct the investigation as broadly as they would have liked. He went on to tell Lisa Peterson for Connecticut Magazine, quote, There was a lot more personal domestic history in the Brown case than in the Crafts case. Perhaps we weren't persistent enough, But then again, the case didn't get enough attention in the press back then either. If the Crafts case and Regina's disappearance had happened today, the news would be camped out in our parking lot. End quote. Prior to retiring, Detective Tavarzik met with Sergeant Darlene Froelich, the Newtown Police Department's evidence officer, to review boxes and boxes of case notes and files to confirm everything was available for the next investigator. It remains a case that haunts him all these years later. Tvardzik is not the only former Newtown officer who continues to think of Regina and their inability to bring her and her family justice. Former Chief Michael DeJoseph also spoke to Connecticut Magazine and, in a moment of somber regret and difficult reflection, he told reporters that they may not have handled the case as thoroughly as they should have, though this was due in part, he believed, to a lack of officers, time, and technology to really get all the information and evidence they sought. Chief DeJoseph explained, quote, In retrospect, there was a lot more we should have done, but the resources, the manpower, and even the forensic tests weren't available back then. End quote. Several members of the media raised the question of race arguing that perhaps the reason the Hella Crafts investigation received so much attention, both from the media and investigators, and Regina's did not, was due to the fact that Hella and Richard were white, while Regina and Willis were black. Lisa Peterson, who had covered Hella's case extensively, and later began digging into Regina's, told the News Times, quote, We were all wrapped up in the wood chipper case. I think part of it was the race angle. Hella Crafts was a pretty white woman and Regina Brown was black. End quote. Peterson, for her article in Connecticut Magazine, spoke with David J. Krychek, a professor and author who's written extensively about media bias when covering crime. Krychek argued that, even 20 years later, Regina's case would likely have been handled the same way, saying, quote, The Brown case would still get just lip service, and then the media would focus on the missing, young, white, blonde woman. Crime is all about politics, and politics can play a huge role in decisions about which crimes will get the full attention of police. Elected officials can feel pressure from the public to solve certain crimes. A high-profile murder, a child's disappearance, a celebrity crime. They, in turn, put pressure on law enforcers. These cases almost invariably are those that have drawn the white-hot lights of the media. That is how and why some cases languish and others move to the top of law enforcement's priority list. End quote. While many believe that race surely played a role in how the case was examined, both from an investigative and a news perspective, there's also been the argument that while the Crafts case provided physical evidence of a grisly and horrifying crime, that will always garner more attention than a disappearance with a lot of smoke but little fire to be found. Many investigators believe that had any physical evidence been discovered, be it blood or human remains, there would most certainly have been an arrest made. Tvardzik himself concurred that without a body or physical evidence, they had little they could do to pressure, question, or accuse anyone. I should note, Peterson attempted to interview Willis Brown for her article, Though she claimed that upon introducing herself as a reporter from Connecticut, Brown replied only with, quote, I'm all done with that, end quote, before walking away and refusing to speak further. In 2008, then Newtown Police Chief Michael Kehoe asked to examine all cold cases upon coming into the role of chief. It was hoped that perhaps the passage of time had opened some new doors. 
Chief Kehoe went on to assign each cold case to a new investigator. Regina's disappearance was given to Detective Jason Frank, a 16-year veteran of the department. Frank's investigation would take him to multiple states where he'd both interview new witnesses as well as tracking down and re-interviewing witnesses who had been spoken to back in 1987. Through his investigation, Frank was able to uncover some new details which took the case in different directions. One new piece of information revealed was that during the original investigation in 87, police had been trying to track down a plane which Brown owned at the time. Newtown police had wanted to find the plane and access its flight records to determine if Brown had flown at any time in the days surrounding Regina's disappearance. In 87, they couldn't find the plane, but Frank broke through and managed to track it down. The plane, described by police as a Cessna, was owned by Brown, and it was known that he had used it to fly both in and out of Block Island over the years. Detective Frank located the plane, which gave him the ability to approach the airport in search of flight records. Unfortunately, the airport was a small one, and in the years prior to 9-11, when airline security was far less strict, they were required to keep flight logs, but they were no longer in possession of them. Without the logs and paperwork to prove it, Detective Frank could not definitively link Brown or his plane to any particular flights or activities during the time of Regina's disappearance. It appeared that while this new evidence could potentially break the case open, it was unfortunately yet another frustrating dead end where there was not enough solid evidence to make any particular connections. Frank later told the Times News, quote, he was using a very small airport and there was no mandated record of flight patterns that there would be today, end quote. Three years later in 2011, the News Times conducted a series of interviews where they spoke with Chief Kehoe, Detective Frank, and Linda Van Horn. Chief Kehoe referred to Brown as a person of interest in the case, though he wouldn't expand much on that description. When asked about Brown, Linda Van Horn was more direct, saying, quote, I do believe that Willis Brown murdered her, and I do believe that God will get him if nobody else does. That's the peace I've made with it, end quote. During his investigation, Frank spoke to Willis Brown, who he described as being very cooperative, though what, if anything, came out of those conversations has never been revealed. What became clear is that investigators wanted to find the answers. They wanted to see Regina's case come to some conclusion, but once again, they were left in a situation where they lacked the evidence needed. Detective Tvardzik, retired, also spoke with the News Times and expressed a similar desire, saying, quote, Unsolved cases stay with you forever. 25 years later, a lot of people still want to know what happened. This story needs an ending. End quote. Two years later, in 2013, a horrifying discovery would bring an old, long, cold case back into the headlines, and by way of showing that even after decades, cold cases can be solved, Regina's case was also once again being mentioned in articles, long and short, discussing Connecticut's most notorious unsolved cases. Three years before Regina had vanished, on April 6, 1984, 30-year-old Elizabeth Heath went missing. Her disappearance occurred just days after her husband, John Heath, officially filed for divorce. At the time, Heath told investigators that his wife, upset by the divorce, had taken $600 in cash and run off in the middle of the night sometime on either April 1st or 2nd. While his explanation was consistent to police, his story would change depending on the audience, as friends told investigators that Heath said his wife had run off without taking anything. Despite a long investigation, police were never able to determine what became of Elizabeth, and much like in Regina's case, they lacked any solid evidence to charge anyone. While many looked at John as the most likely culprit, there was nothing to directly tie him to his wife's disappearance. At least, not until 26 years later. Heath had lost the home and the lands he and Elizabeth had shared in a foreclosure, and the new owners were planning renovations to the barn. In April of 2010, while tearing up a damaged floor, a father and son discovered an empty space, what has since been described as an open well or septic area. According to NBC News, inside this space they found pillows, a blanket, a pillowcase, and a bag of what appeared to be bones. 
The medical examiner's office came into possession of a complete skeleton and positively identified the remains as being those of Elizabeth Heath, as well as confirming that her death had been a homicide caused by multiple blows to the head. Court records state that the 30-year-old had been wrapped up in bedding and shoved headfirst into the hole in the floor with a plastic bag over her head. John Heath, at the age of 70, was set to go to trial charged with the murder of his former wife. At the time, he was in ill health, suffering from COPD, and was confined to a wheelchair. Heath was offered a plea deal which would require him to plead guilty to the crime and face a lesser sentence, likely closer to 25 years rather than the 60 he could otherwise receive. John, though, argued that he was innocent and he would not accept any deal that required him to admit guilt. Three years later, in December of 2013, a jury found him guilty. Throughout the trial, the prosecution had relied on the testimony of law enforcement as well as a taped interview with Heath where he spoke negatively about his ex-wife. The state alleged that Heath had killed his wife in order to avoid losing custody of his daughter and possibly the home he'd been living in since 1973. Following the conviction, a sentence of 50 years was imposed. Heath maintained his innocence and his lawyer Frank O'Reilly argued that he would be appealing the conviction. But Heath never walked free again, dying in prison just two years later in 2015 at the age of 73. After the story broke, newspaper articles began pouring out discussing Elizabeth's disappearance and the discovery of her remains in the trial. Many of these reports addressed both Hella Crafts and Regina Brown, and a new surge of interest arose with the Newtown police noting that they were continuing to investigate Regina's disappearance. The same year Heath was found guilty, state's attorney Walter Flanagan was asked about Regina and the status of Willis Brown as a person of interest in light of developments in the Heath case. Flanagan told the Connecticut Post, quote, There were incidents of violence and there was a family relations file and a lot of other information that can't be made public. In my opinion, he obviously was the only suspect, but we never had enough to get an arrest warrant. End quote. The story, sadly, remained the same. The following year in 2014, Rhode Island Monthly spoke to Detective Frank, who noted that no evidence was ever found to support Brown's theory that his wife had simply run off, but that his influence had managed to control the opinions of his children, as Frank explained, quote, All the kids believe their mother ran away. That's the information Willis provided to them as they were growing up. End quote. That same year, Regina and details of her case were added to decks of cards provided to inmates in hopes of generating new tips on cold cases. Regina was displayed as the queen of clubs, and investigators were hopeful about new tips coming in, telling reporters that, in the past, this method had brought new information to light on other unsolved cases. Whether or not those cards played a role in new developments remains uncertain, but two years later in 2016, there was once again movement on Regina's case. On Tuesday, May 31st, a large police presence was observed moving on to Whippoorwill Hill Road, accompanied by employees of the Town Public Works Department who brought with them heavy equipment for cutting back brush and removing trees, as well as a backhoe for digging. The focus for investigators appeared to be a section of 102 acres of land to the north and west of the road, adjacent to the former Brown home, according to the new town B. When asked about what exactly they were doing and whether or not it was connected to Regina Brown, police chief James Viadero told the B, quote, The only thing we can elaborate on is that we are diligently working on the case. The search on Whippoorwill Hill Road is in conjunction with the Brown case, and we will be searching the area for evidence for several more days. The case is active and remains a priority with this agency. Due to the fact that it is an open investigation and sensitive in nature, we cannot elaborate further. We will share any new developments that change the status of the case as soon as it is practical to do so. End quote. The search, which was conducted over several days, involved the use of multiple cadaver dogs brought in from the group Resources in Search and Rescue Incorporated. 
Anytime one of the dogs indicated the possible presence of human remains, heavy equipment was used to excavate that area, and according to the News Times, several areas were dug up. Chief Fiadero would not state what had brought them to search the area, though he did make references that police had new methods and technology that might help advance the case, things which were not available in previous years. The search ended up zeroing in on a section of land described as being approximately 1.5 acres within a few hundred feet of the house at 18 Whippoorwill Hill Road. Investigators speaking to reporters wouldn't give out much information, though the Newtown Bee reported that police said they were seeking physical evidence in what they referred to as a homicide investigation. Court documents utilized to gain warrants for the digging were more specific, saying, quote, Regina Brown has not been located or heard from in over 29 years. Knowing that Willis Brown had been physically violent with Regina during the course of their relationship, police believe there are human remains buried in an area where all four canines are alerting. End quote. Reportedly, the area in which the dogs indicated was less than 200 feet from the new town home. What was found, if anything, is unknown, as Chief Valladero chose not to disclose any information to reporters following completion of the digging. As of now, five years have passed since this search and excavation were executed, and there has been no additional information revealed about the status of the case, any new evidence, or what led investigators back to Newtown in 2016. Sadly, it appears that 34 years later, The mystery of what became of Regina Brown continues to endure despite all attempts to pull back the veil. When last seen, Regina Brown was described as being a black female with brown hair and brown eyes, standing 5 feet 3 inches tall and weighing approximately 115 pounds. Regina normally wears her hair pulled back in a ponytail and is of Creole descent, and it is noted that some articles and police files list her as being white due to her lighter skin tone. At the time of her disappearance, Regina was described as wearing a white fleece jacket, later recovered at her home, a white sweater, white sweatpants with a light tan stripe, size 7.5 tan snakeskin-like shoes, a size 34B bra, and a gold rope necklace with a diamond pendant. Regina has a scar on her abdomen from a C-section. She's missing three teeth and has multiple fillings, and her dental records are on file. She was last seen at approximately 7 p.m. at New York's LaGuardia Airport on Thursday, March 26, 1987. Regina disappeared when she was 35 years old, and if alive today, she would be turning 69 this year. It's been 34 years since Regina vanished after leaving the airport. Next year, 2022, will mark a somber anniversary, as Regina will officially have been missing for as many years as she was known to be alive. In her absence, Regina's children grew up in the home of their maternal grandparents, though they would eventually live with their father, Willis Brown. Regina's father, Emil, passed away in 1988, and her mother followed nearly 20 years later, in August of 2006. Neither ever found out the truth of what became of their beloved daughter, and with their loss, her siblings now take up the mantle of seeking justice. Regina's case remains open and under investigation with the Newtown Police, who refer to it as active, though there have been no public developments in the past five years. Willis Brown lives in Texas and maintains a home in the Northeast. Over the past 34 years, he's found himself in court a few times, though all cases appear to be related to bankruptcy or financial issues regarding American Airlines. Today, he is 85 years old and has not spoken publicly about Regina's disappearance since the early 1990s. Over more than three decades, his story has remained consistent with him saying that he did not see Regina in the days before her disappearance, nor did he have any involvement in it. For many, they believe the likelihood of seeing justice done in their lifetime shrinks with each passing day, though Regina's former neighbor and friend, Linda Van Horn, believes that can't last forever. Speaking to the News Times in 2016, she stated, quote, I would hope that someday they find Regina so that she can be given back to her family, 
and the perpetrator is tried and goes to jail. We should all be held accountable for crimes. Regina Brown vanished on Thursday, March 26, 1987, after sending her youngest daughter to join her two older children in Texas. 34 years later, it seems, while the investigation has continued to accumulate information, with files being referred to by a prosecutor as voluminous, there's never been a charge filed or an arrest made. And I know what you're thinking. I'm thinking it too. But that brings us back to something we've discussed in several episodes recently. The difference between knowing something and being able to prove what you believe you know. Over 34 years, there hasn't been a great deal of mincing words. Those who think they know the answers have shared them. And while that's remained consistent with only one person ever being named as the likely suspect, there's never been enough evidence to say with absolute certainty nor to bring it before a judge. So, in most cases, we examine a series of theories that have been made about the case. In a lot of missing persons cases, it comes down to the person either chose to disappear, which almost is never the answer, or they were the victim of foul play. Once you've established the likelihood of foul play, you've got to look at who may have been responsible, and we often divide that into two sections. A stranger, someone random who happened upon the victim, or someone closer, someone they knew. This case is somewhat different in that we don't have a series of theories to examine. Almost no one, from friends and family to the police themselves, believe that Regina ran off on her own. It simply wouldn't make sense. She was a devoted mother. She was close to her family. She loved her job. And then one day she was gone. I think it's safe to say that if Regina were still alive out there somewhere, short of a massive bout of amnesia, there's no way she'd have stayed hidden away all these years. She loved her children dearly and wouldn't have abandoned them. She surely would have shown up for the divorce trial and fought for custody of the kids, or at least supported her parents when they took up the fight. Her social security number has never been used again. She's never popped up on the grid. There have been no sightings, no reports of Regina living out there somewhere in the United States or around the world. In order to believe she ran off, one would have to believe many things that don't make any sense at all. Her call to Hope Lambert about her plan to go to Texas would have had to have been an elaborate ruse. Sending her children to Texas would have had to have been to afford her the ability to run away, rather than to get them somewhere that she could arrive safely. She'd had to have gone with no money, no car, nothing but the clothes on her back, and even some of those were found in the house after she disappeared. Her admissions to friends about her fears of being abused or even killed would have had to have been exaggerated, and we know from court testimony they weren't. When Regina disappeared, she was about to enter a difficult divorce trial while trying to buy new furniture, installing a security system, getting a dog for protection, and working to get home repairs finished. To put it plainly, there is nothing in Regina's behaviors prior to or at the time of her disappearance to suggest she would have ever done this by choice. She was officially declared dead in 1995. And while no body's been found, court documents show police have argued that it is unreasonable to believe she's alive out there in the world after no contact for 34 years. So if Regina Brown didn't choose to disappear, then it seems clear that someone made her disappear. The belief that foul play was involved in this case began from the first moments for friends and family, and while police took longer to come around, it was less than two weeks later when her car was found that they believed something terrible had happened. While they've never gotten the evidence they needed to prove what happened, they've also never found a single piece of evidence to contradict the foul play likelihood. So, the case remains in a limbo of sorts, despite the existence of circumstantial evidence, witness testimony, court documents, and police records which display a history of domestic violence which, as one judge put it, reduced Regina's life to a living nightmare. I think the best way to approach this is to do something a little different. Take every name associated with this case and clear it from your mind. Instead, focus on what we do know and follow that information to the most likely scenario. Starting at the beginning, we have a five-year history of domestic abuse, which is supported by calls to domestic abuse hotlines and police arrest records, not to mention court testimony confirming that abuse took place. The victim is a 35-year-old mother of three who, in the aftermath, lives alone in the home she once shared with her husband. He moved out early on, 
When he first decided he wanted a divorce, though, he still could get into the house and did come over from time to time. During divorce proceedings conducted in the absence of the wife due to her disappearance, the estranged husband accuses her of drug abuse, infidelity, suffering from mental health issues, and from doing things to purposefully cause him to become violent so that she could notify authorities. The husband, over several years, alleges that his children are not his and that his wife became pregnant by other men despite paternity tests proving that to be false. When his wife was reported missing, the man told authorities to look for her in high drug areas of New York City, and days later when her car is found, that's exactly where it is. I should note, the location where her car was found is approximately 16 miles west of where the husband lived at the time in Queens and more than 65 miles southwest of the home in Newtown. For the record, LaGuardia Airport is less than 10 miles east of where the car was found. The investigation goes to show that items in the Newtown home seem to confirm that the wife made it there after the airport. Garments she was wearing were located there along with groceries she had purchased and a check she'd picked up from work. When the car was found, it's located with only the ignition key present, absent of the keychain and additional keys as expressly described by the live-in babysitter who drove to the airport when the wife went missing. To me, this means only one of two things. Either the missing wife's car key was removed from the ring and left in the vehicle, or those keys remained somewhere with her, and a secondary key was used, perhaps one left behind in the home or in the possession of her estranged husband. Prior to her disappearance, the wife notifies her close friends of a plan to flee to Texas where she sent her children. She specifically tells this friend to place a call two days later and that, if by then no one has seen or heard from her, wait an additional two days before notifying police. If she's not heard from, she warns, her ex-husband is likely responsible. Unfortunately, this plan may have deterred the investigation somewhat as rather than the wife being reported missing in the first days, a week passed before that happened. Over the course of those seven days, no one is truly sure what happened. The husband claims to have not been in the home since the 23rd or 24th, two and three days prior to the disappearance, nor to have been there in several days after, marking April 6th as his return, though this is later corrected by his dentist as being April 2nd. This means the husband was at the home two to three days before his estranged wife vanished and then again four to five days after. Witnesses place him there around that time with a large bag of dog food, which is later found in the house. At first, he denies being there, but later confirms he did bring the dog food there. So, you have him at the house during the week of the disappearance, but the home itself yields no physical evidence. An assortment of people from the missing woman's life give their opinions. Her best friend believes she was killed. Her neighbor and close friend believes the husband knows what happened. A map drawn by the husband's stepmother suggests the possibility of the wife's body being buried nearby to where he owns a business on Block Island, and the stepmother's sister claims that the woman directly told her she believed the husband killed the wife. Searches on Block Island produced no results either. Neither did searches in Newtown. In the end, investigators are trying to solve a disappearance and or murder with no body, no blood, no prints, no physical evidence, and no witness to a crime or the concealment of a body. Now, I already know based on the emails I've received from countless other cases that everyone's going to have the same theory. The husband did it. That seems to be the belief amongst friends and family. Investigators won't go that far, saying only that the husband is a person of interest. The problem, as stated earlier, though, comes down to proof. You can believe something all you want. You can add up all the angles, examine all the evidence, and come to a conclusion, but you can't prove it, and that's why this case has remained stuck. While evidence points one way, there's simply never been enough to state that, on the record, in front of a judge, for a warrant, this is what happened. Unfortunately, that makes this one of those cases where everyone believes the solution is obvious, but no one can actually support the solution with anything carrying legal bearing. Without more, this case is never going to see an arrest or trial. Some would argue that it's possible something else had gone on there, that there could have been the miraculous involvement of some unknown third party who's responsible for Regina Brown's disappearance. While that doesn't make a great deal of sense to those who are familiar with the evidence and the story, that's also part of the problem. A defense attorney doesn't need to prove his client is innocent, but instead to create a situation in which any number of other scenarios could have happened. 
Just as we can't prove that any one particular person willfully and violently subdued, killed, and concealed Regina, we can't prove that no one else did so either. While it may be frustrating to those who knew and loved Regina, and to those of you listening today, me included, the courts don't function based on hearsay and speculation. They're grounded in what can be proven, and here we can prove little besides the fact that prior to her disappearance, Regina Brown was in fear for her life and suffered horrible abuse at the hands of the very man she feared. There isn't really another direction to go here, is there? Another theory to examine. Could Regina have been the victim of a random act of violence perpetrated by someone who's never come up throughout this investigation? Yeah, as much as it seems like the least likely scenario, it can't be ruled out at this state. Could Regina have been targeted by her estranged husband who pulled off a massive crime without leaving behind any solid evidence to link him to it? Yeah, this is also possible, and for many, the more likely answer to the question of Regina's fate. Again, though, we have to confront the stark reality that without more evidence, solid evidence, there's little that can be done. Different investigators have worked this case over the years, and while I certainly agree with media depictions and even admissions from former Newtown police that this case was not properly handled in the beginning, it does seem that detectives in the years since have done everything they possibly can think of to solve it. Detective Tvardzik worked the case for nearly 20 years, following leads, going to other states, interviewing witnesses, tracking down tips. He went to Block Island to put up flyers, questioned locals, and even called in assistance from the FBI. Detective Frank took over later, going back to square one, and investigating everything as though it had never been done before. He managed to find new evidence, but it was noted it wasn't enough for a warrant. He found the plane police had sought early on, but due to a lack of proper record keeping, where exactly that plane was between March 26th and April 2nd is unknown. In 2016, a massive search was launched in Newtown. Cadaver dogs indicated the presence of remains. Different areas were excavated, but in the end it appears that if anything was found, it wasn't enough to move forward or share publicly. Two major cases were solved during this investigation. Richard Crafts was convicted of murdering his wife, missing flight attendant Hella Crafts, in a most brutal and grisly fashion. He'd go on to serve just over 30 years. John Heath was arrested, tried, and convicted of murdering his estranged wife, Elizabeth, who went missing in 1984. Her remains were recovered on his former property, hidden beneath the floor in 2010, and he has since died behind bars. There are currently more than 1,000 open cold cases in the state of Connecticut, and that of Regina Brown remains one of the more mysterious and frustrating examples. Hope, however, is not yet lost. If answers can be found in cases around this country 30, 40, 50, and more years later, there remains the possibility that the disappearance of Regina Brown may someday be brought to a close. As time passes, people get comfortable and speak out. Technology advances unlock secrets hidden in plain sight, and investigative techniques continue to evolve, finding new ways to solve the seemingly unsolvable. 35-year-old Regina Brown has been missing for 34 years. Declared dead in 1995, her children are now adults, older than she was when she vanished. What they truly believe about their mother's disappearance is an answer only they can supply, but I do think it's unlikely to believe they've never once questioned the story they were told about her running off. Regina's parents have since passed away, never knowing the truth, and those friends who loved her remain frustrated with the lack of developments. Perhaps most tragic is that Regina Brown not only foresaw her end, she tried to find a way to escape it. She made a plan, set it into motion, and in the hours prior to her own escape, someone caught up with her. Someone ensured Regina Brown never made it out of Connecticut. Someone stole her away from her family, robbed her children of a loving mother, and left a dark and disturbing mystery behind. Unfortunately, without the discovery of new evidence, calls and tips from those with knowledge of what happened, the discovery of Regina's body, or an outright confession which seems unlikely to ever arrive, the vanishing of Regina Brown will remain open, unsolved, 
and perhaps not as cold as it had once been. If you're looking for more information about the vanishing of Regina Brown, the Hartford Courant, Newtown B, and Connecticut Magazine have done detailed coverage. Journalist Lisa Peterson has been putting together information to release a book discussing the case, and you can follow her blog in which she discusses Regina's case in many posts at lisaunleashed.com. Regina is listed in NCIC as case number M68619723, and she is on NamUs case number MP2018. There is also a Facebook page dedicated to the case, which you can find by searching for Missing American Airlines Flight Attendant Regina F. Brown. If you have any information about the disappearance of Regina Brown, please contact the Newtown Department of Police Services at 203-426-5841. You can also call Crime Stoppers at 1-800-222-TIPS. That's 1-800-222-8477. What do you believe happened? Tweet me at TraceEvPod. Message me on Instagram at TraceEvidencePod. Email me at traceevidencepod at gmail.com or comment in the Facebook group. These episodes have delved into some truly horrifying details about the abuse and violence Regina Brown suffered. On average, nearly 20 people per minute are physically abused by an intimate partner in the United States. That means at this point in today's episode, from the beginning... 1,720 people have been the victims of violence at the hands of an intimate partner. Domestic or intimate partner violence is a horrifying situation so many suffer under, but there are options to get help. If you or someone you love has been or is currently the victim of intimate partner abuse, please reach out to the National Domestic Violence Hotline at 1-800-799-SAFE. That's 1-800-799-7233. You can also text the word START to 88788 or visit the website thehotline.org where you have access to live chat support. All calls and messages are free, confidential, and anonymous, and help is available 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Trace evidence would not be possible without support from amazing listeners like you. And now I'd like to take a moment to thank our fantastic Patreon producers. Alicia Lorraine. Anne Bertram. Aurora Kay. Bacon Bits the Cat. Brittany Bivens. Christine Greco. Krista Colvin. Dave Allen. Denise Dingsdale. Diane Dyson. Eric Sumpter, Guillerme Pinto, Heather Louise, James, Jen Treb, Jennifer Winkler, Joni Berkwitz, Kara Moreland, Marla Wright, Melissa Brakizen, Nick Mohar Schurz, Orange Patches, Quinn McBreen, Roberta Jansen, Sarah Levonen, Sarah Mascaratolo, Sarah Lyons, Travis Skepko, Stephanie Joyner, Stephanie Eve, Tom Archer, Tom Radford, Tracy Woods, and Walter Jansen. Your contributions to Trace Evidence are invaluable, and your support of the show is both appreciated and extremely humbling. If you're interested in supporting Trace Evidence and gaining access to exclusive merch and ad-free episodes, please visit patreon.com slash traceevidence or go to trace-evidence.com and click on the support option. That's going to conclude this week's episode. If you haven't already, please consider rating the show on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen. Five stars would be greatly appreciated, but it's up to you. Share these episodes, spread the word, and maybe together we can help bring justice to those who have been deprived of it. 
Thank you all once again for listening, supporting the show, and for being the best listeners a podcaster could ask for. Thank you again for listening to this episode, and I hope you'll join me next week for another unsolved case on the next episode of Trace Evidence.